The business world has certainly changed in many ways. And with those changes comes the likely need for new products and services, both to existing and new markets. For many, that may yet be another challenge and they may not rise to it. But that would be a shame because without change and innovation, a business may simply die. So how to bring a new product to market that will sell? I needed to talk to someone who's done it and is doing it. She's the CEO of strategy and design firm, Marinus Bo. Let's start the Leila de Palmahi show by saying welcome, Leila. Thank you so much, Malcolm. I'm so happy to be here. We're, we're delighted to be chatting to you. And I just remember, tell everybody, you are in New York City. This Leila Balmahi show, BBTV show, is in three parts, identify, create, and market. In part three, she will give you her proven guidance on getting your new product to market. In part two, she will show you how to create a product or service that meets the identified target market need. Brand it so it resonates and attracts and price it so it sells to reach set and profitable goals. But you can't achieve parts two and three without the essential part in part one. How to research markets and customers to find a need gap and test the viability of that gap. But Leila, before we get started on part one, give us a brief overview of you and your experience. Well, thank you so much for that amazing setup. You know, I help companies of all sizes get unstuck. So when a company has enjoyed success, Decades into their business, they hit a wall and they don't know how to get to the next level, they call me in. When a startup or existing business is looking to launch a new market, uh, you know, invent a new product, but they're unsure of the next steps that will make that initiative successful, they call me in. And the reason that I've been able to consistently create these, these solutions and solve some of the most complex challenges businesses face is I take a very methodical approach to research that's quite unique. And I'm really excited in this interview to share some of my go-to tips, things that have worked again and again, uh, the questions that I ask, the methodologies that I, that I take. Um, and so I do this in three key ways. The first is product development. And I think the most important thing about product development when done right is that it must be pragmatic, stemming from a really deep understanding of the consumer. And when we know who they are, the solutions are often really inexpensive. The second way is marketing strategy. In the same way, when you really know who your target audience is, um, you can create strategies, and we'll talk more about this. I'm really excited to share strategies, not just to acquire one consumer and then pay to acquire another consumer, but strategies to acquire one consumer and create exponential growth because that one person tells 10 people who then tell 10 people. And so I'm, I'm really excited to share more about that. And the third way is business strategy consulting, right? Understanding, serving as a fractional CMO, understanding the objectives of the business and tweaking the actual business model to uh, you know, respond to market trends, to respond to what's going on. Um, and so I'll talk more about that too in this interview. Um, but I'm really excited to share more and get started. Excellent. Thanks, Leila. Now let's get into part one. Anyways, <laughs> over to you, Viable Need part one. Thank you. All right. So, of course, I, you know, I am such an advocate of always talking to your consumers because they're going to give you the, the guidebook for value creation. So the first step is that, that I say is talk to your consumers. And then a lot of my clients say, well, we don't know who the, the target audience actually is. And there's a lot of nuance to identify this. But I would say that in general, a perspective that oftentimes is not mainstream is that identifying your target audience is more of an iterative process. It's, it, you don't know right away. So let me give you an example that illustrates that. I work with a lot of Fortune 100s, um, mid-sized businesses and startups, but I'm gonna share with you an example that I, I am able to share, which is a couples therapy group. So they came to me with the goal of, of, of course, increasing their revenue. And the way that they wanted to increase revenue is through daytime appointments, filling the daytime appointments. So that makes a lot of sense. So I spoke to their consumers to understand how we could get people to come into their daytime appointments. But what I saw was that a lot of their existing clients who were, you know, working professionals didn't have the en enough autonomy over their schedule to get two people in the couple to come consistently in the middle of the day. 
And that just felt like an upward battle to try to address, trying to get people to change their fundamental schedule to be able to work for a business. And that's really not how things should work. So I said, okay, well, who is an audience that has autonomy over their schedule? High net worth individuals. And what do high net worth individuals not have? What is the unmet need in the market? They don't have time, but yet they can meet in the middle of the day on Tuesday. And, and so I created this concept for the business. Instead of filling their daytime slots for like $300, I helped them create a intensive for couples to come in and for $15,000 and up, really work on their marriage and figure out in one sitting, you know, if this makes sense to continue or not. And, and so they increase revenue by 4x by reimagining who their target audience is. And so I would encourage people to speak to their target audience and not be limited by the barriers that are identified in that first round of research, but then say, okay, is that worth, is that a problem worth solving? Is, or is there another audience that might be better to address this problem and create another product? So after you figure out who to talk to, you want to identify, of course, the unmet need. And so these are my top three questions for kickstarting that process. The first, I love asking this question and there's so much insight that you get from it when you say, what are you most looking forward to? This is the blueprint for the biggest unmet need in your life. If you tell me what you're most looking forward to, I'm looking forward to a vacation. And then I say, oh, that's great. Why are you looking forward to a vacation? I want to have quality time with my spouse. Mm -hmm. Well, that means that that's what you're missing today in your life quality time with your spouse. So if as a company, you can facilitate that, and by the way, B2B can also facilitate that because they're selling to humans too. It's about saving time on the B2B side so that they can have more quality time with their spouse. If you can help them achieve what they're most looking forward to today, you become an invaluable partner. And you can't ask people, what are you most lacking in your life? But you can ask them, what are you most looking forward to? Okay, so the just second, say that one. Just say that one again, Lila, so that so people can write that one down. Write that question yes, down, thank you. Yours. What are you most looking forward to? Okay, this is excellent. a really valuable question that I yeah. start many interviews with. Simple, simple, but powerful. But powerful, yes. And the so the next question that I like to ask is, what is your most prized possession? Because if I can deconstruct the anatomy of someone's most prized possession, you know exactly what is valuable to them. And if you can create what's most valuable, then that's something that they're willing to pay a premium for. Another way to ask this question, depending on the context, is what items are on your wish list and why, depending on what you're looking to achieve from that question. Um, you know, I did research with gamers and saw that the gamers were looking to game the system. So the things that they loved the most were um, things that you could buy that would have a really long lifespan. For instance, um, a pot that lasted mm. 10 years. That was their most prized possession because they felt like they gamed the system. Like they got something that had a lot of value for a long time. And so the project was to identify how you can create digital goods in a, in a game that people would be willing to buy. And it's interesting because what informed that and that strategy was so successful once we figured out the fact that it had to operate like their most prized possessions. You buy yeah. it and, it and it provides value over time. So mm. what is your most prized possession? Excellent. That's second question. Yeah. Second question. Yeah. Third question. What is your fondest memory? Understanding mm. a moment worth remembering allows you to build a customer experience worth treasuring. Um, and really the third is after you identify their biggest unmet need, you want to ideate solutions with them. So with the couples therapy client, I built a landing page highlighting the high end couples retreat, put it in front of the target audience and got feedback. Now, people are nice. They're always going to say they love it. But what you need to do is not listen to what they say, but listen to what they mean. Mm -hmm. And so I always ask this pre-mortem question to really get to the heart of this because so many businesses launch and they say, well, everybody said they'll buy it and then they yeah. don't buy it. Yeah, yeah. So how do you make sure that people will actually buy it when you launch? Two things. First, ask them if a year from now I came back to you and I said, gosh, this couples therapy concept didn't work. What are the specific reasons today you think that may not work? And they will tell you. And if they say some reasons, that's the blueprint for value creation. If they don't say any reasons, then, and they say, gosh, I can't think of anything. This is amazing. How do I buy this? You know, you're ready to launch. And I keep doing this in an iterative fashion until at least two people say, 
how do I buy this? And that's when you know you're ready to launch because it's going to work. Excellent. Yeah. I really like that approach that you've got there because it, it's powerful, it's in depth, but most important of all, you're not just sitting in some magic office building inventing a yes. product and you know, you're going out to the public, the users, the buyers, whatever it may be, isn't it? Brilliant. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Lila, I think it was time we moved to uh, part two. That was essential grounding work and brilliant. Let's, so let's go to part two, which is create. How to create a product or service that meets the identified need. Brand it so it resonates and attracts and price it so it sells to reach set and profitable goals. Mm, over to you again. <laughs> Excellent. So it's no surprise that I'm going to say we need to talk to our customers. So the first part of the process is understanding exactly what type of brand is a brand that they're going to tell their friends about? What type of product is a product they're going to tell their friends about? Because that's how we achieve the exponential growth that's going to create a more sustainable business. When thinking about how to develop a brand, it's really important to develop a brand that resonates with the audience and not with the team in the boardroom. You know, the Mariner's Bow website, if we put ourselves into the psychology of who's coming to the website, they're very successful. They've achieved tons of success, but yet they've hit a wall. And so they're kind of confused. They're kind of overwhelmed. They feel stuck. What do they want? They want clarity. So from a design perspective, the website is black, white, yellow, heavy, bold fonts, very clear. It telegraphs clarity. And when you create a brand, you really want to create something that is strategically furthering the promise that you're offering on a really deep human level. A lot of clients come to me and say, hey, we just did a redesign. Check out our website. And I say, yeah, it's beautiful, but the, it's not driving the insight. So how do you get to those insights? So to understand how to create a brand that resonates with the audience, I ask these sorts of questions to kickstart this. One, if someone were to call you up tomorrow and, you, and tell you, look no further, we have exactly what you've been looking for. We have a couples therapy service that's going to solve your challenges. What would they say? What would they say? And so then you listen to the people and they'll pitch it to you. And basically they'll tell you the words you need to use, the benefits you need to outline. And the job of, uh, of the interviewer is to identify why they said each of those things, because you really want to understand the hierarchy. So the first thing that they say is not necessarily the most important. They, that's just what they said because they didn't plan this out, which is the beauty of that question. But the next step is to say, what's the hierarchy here? And what's the meaning really on a deeper level of each of these lines? For instance, if they say, this is so valuable because it will allow me to make more progress in my marriage. Well, that's great. I really want to understand what is progress to you because progress to you might mean reaching your goals sooner. Progress to a gamer might be beating their personal best. So these things really differ by cohort and a lot of businesses launch things. If they get to this point, they launch things that oftentimes are just a little bit off because they're launching on assumptions that are not tested. And so it's really important to test every assumption with questions like, why are each of those things most important to you? You use this word. What does that word mean to you? And going deeper and deeper. When I do interviews, I do I, I have an AI transcript going at the same time. So I literally have their words in front of me and I can go line by line with them. Uh, the second way to understand um, what the brand should be is asking people if, if the brand were a person, what type of person would they be? What would be their personality? How would they talk? What would they wear? This gives you a sense of the tone and the general feel. So that first question helps you figure out the messaging. The sex, second question helps you figure out exactly what is the brand look and feel. And you can ask them um, further, what is your favorite brand in the world and why? And then you deconstruct it. Really what you're trying to understand is what they expect from your brand. Those, those are the first two questions. And the second, the third question here is what do they expect from the best brands in the world? And when you overlap those two, that's a recipe for an unforgettable brand. Uh, so this is how you start to develop a brand that's really going to resonate with people mm. and go deeper and deeper um, in yeah, terms of and, pricing. I, I'm with you on, on totally on that one. But I've often found in the past, and I, I'll give you a little story. I was doing focus groups and managing focus groups for an 
the launch of an evening newspaper in a UK city. And consistently, the focus groups did not like the way that the paper was put. It, it was a historic city in, in the UK and they live within the walls and the people there think that a bit more elite. They didn't like the tabloid look that the editor was saying. And he kept saying to me, uh, no, they don't know what they're talking about. I know what it is. And in the end, he insisted not to do the research. He launched his own paper. It lasted a few months. It's a cautionary tale. Mm. You know, uh, a lot of the time clients will, after doing the research, will have a moment where they say, there's a Steve Jobs opportunity here to give people what they think that they want, uh, what, what we know that they want, not what they think what, that they want. Yeah. And what I say to that is that there's, there's a deeper thing at play. Steve Jobs was looking at the desire for people to have some, a tool like a bicycle that would allow them to think different. You, you're, when you're building a brand that's really effective, you're not looking at the more surface level stuff, you're looking at the deeper stuff. And, and so it's not that he just didn't do any type of analysis of humans and what they want, you know? And so I think on the deeper level, the tabloid feel, um, it's important to understand like, what does the tabloid mean to people, you know, on a mm. deeper, deeper level? So um, that's a cautionary tale. It's a really interesting story. Yeah. Okay, let's move to part three, market. How to take your new product or service to market in the fastest and most economical and efficient way possible with a structured plan. How to monitor and measure the plan to achieve goals. Hey, back to you again. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm going to share two case studies that demonstrate how to acquire new customers at a low price in a way that actually decreases the timeline in the sales cycle and also increases brand affinity. So when we think about measurement, a lot of clients are not tracking this one metric that is really a game changer when we think about um, how to grow a business organically and exponentially, which is what is the percentage of your sales that are attributed to word of mouth and referrals. Mm -hmm. If it's not above 80%, I highly encourage people to just stop everything and figure out why that is. Because if you're not actually, if you're actually providing value and you're actually doing a great job, then there's no reason that somebody that is buying from you shouldn't tell at least one person. And oftentimes it's just a little adjustment in terms of messaging or what materials you provide someone to be able to achieve that. Um, and so, you know, I was working with a client, um, you know, half of the clients that I work with are B2B. So this was a B2B client in a service-based business, very expensive product they were selling, very technical, and they were very focused on content marketing and SEO and building out a Google ba search-based strategy. And my hypothesis was that that wasn't what was happening. Mm. Um, but I interviewed their very senior level client profile and quickly realized that the flow those guys were taking was that they were going to their network, asking their colleagues, their friends, their, their, their trusted advisors, what vendor they used, what vendor they trusted. Then they quickly did a search on LinkedIn, checked to see who um, at that company was the, the founder, the head, um, looked to see their mutual connections because their network is very strong and then contacted those people, did uh, an interview to figure out if that person who run the company was trustworthy and good at what they did. And then quickly went to their website, checked out some case studies under five minutes and then called the founder of the company, bypassed the sales team and uh, basically just wanted to figure out how to begin because they had already made their decision. So understanding how people are coming to you is really important. You can figure that out really through an episode reconstruction, call up people in the industry, ask them, how'd you find the last vendor that you worked with in this space? And you'll quickly find that out. And so all of these resources for content marketing and SEO were just not being used at all. So we reallocated them to creating um, a better way for existing clients to promote the services of this business, to basically scale referrals. One great way to do that that we've seen is to create videos highlighting the, the clients, especially in B2B, 
highlighting them, celebrating them with a slight mention of the partnership. And that's something that they'd be willing to post. It's very valuable content. And all of a sudden, now we've just promoted to all of their connections and scaled the referral. So it's a really important way that we found to market in a really cost-effective way. How much does a video cost to get in front of all of those people? And it's mm. hyper-targeted. It's exactly the right type of people. Well, I hope so, because we're on video together now, aren't we? Yeah. Exactly. Hyper-targeted. Hyper I, I, I hyper like exactly what you're saying there, because I find that, you know, I've been in marketing for 40 odd years, and I found that, find that all too often in today's world as well, these supposed marketing agencies have got their own agenda. You know, they may yes. be specialists in pin interest or whatever it may be there. And they say, no, this is what you need. This is what you need. That's what you need. And the client goes off in the wrong way, spends the work, lost amount of money, and the marketing agency just runs away. You know, doing what you're talking about is sound foundation. That's the way to build the, the house or the mansion or whatever it is, isn't it? Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, if you're not partial to any tactic, then you can really recommend a tactic that's going to be most helpful. And I truly have seen again and again that, and I think this is a fear that a lot of clients have, that if they invest in understanding their target audience, then it's going to, they're still going to have to pay for marketing and product. But when you know who your target audience is, the marketing is oftentimes you know, I, ha I have another case study here that, that shows you it's pennies, you mm. know, or, or just the cost of a video. Um, so the second case study, I was working with a company that was looking to launch in New York City among millennials. They had a lean budget. Obviously, this is traditionally uh, not an inexpensive market to launch among. There's a lot of people trying to get their attention. And so what I look to see is what channels no one else was playing in. Uh, because that's where we could advertise cost effectively and have less competition. So the first step I always recommend to clients, look for the channel, first yeah. channel. Yeah. Um, and you can find that also through an episode reconstruction from the morning to the evening. How do you spend your time? We found, of course, that millennials in New York City are ordering a ton of food delivery. And yet nobody was advertising in that channel. So how do you get into a channel cost effectively? Well, you have to provide value. So I went to the restaurants and of course we know many restaurants are margin starved. And I said, well, if we could give you one less expense, would you be willing to collaborate with us? They said, yes, of course, this is a no brainer. So we printed hyper-local cheeky phrases on napkins, gave them to the highest volume pizza delivery, Chinese food restaurants. And just like that, we got into hundreds of thousands of homes for less than the price of a napkin. Right. When you really understand your target audience, it shouldn't cost much to get in front of them. Yeah, excellent. I love that story. It's a, it really is imaginative and innovative. Well done. Lily, it's been inspiring meeting you in this extra special Leila Belmay VVTV web show. I'm, I'm, I'm a brain's buzzing. That's why I can't get the words out. I've been talking to the Just person the who truly knows how to successfully take your new product or service to market. Thank you, Leila. Thank you so much. It was an honor to be here with you.